Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and we wish, we suspect more people will be joining us throughout the presentation. Uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Discover Intelligent Automation and Create Digital Assistance. I am David Rare, a professor at the Shah School of Policy and Government at George Mason University and co-founder of the Virginia Academic Intelligent Automation Community of Practice. The Virginia Automate Automation Community of Practice is a statewide initiative to assist private and public colleges and universities across the Commonwealth to help their institutions understand, implement, share best practices and advance intelligent automation in their respective institutions to increase effectiveness, efficiency, and enhance student engagement. You can find us at ia-va.us. We welcome your engagement with us, and we want to thank 4VA at Mason for their support and encouragement. Briefly, here's how we'll proceed. I will introduce our distinguished panelists my co-director of the VA Academic COP, Dornan Montagnu, will lead the discussion. We'll be moving the panelists around on their specific expertise areas. And I think you'll find it very interesting and very helpful to you, wherever you are in the, innovate, the intelligent innovation process. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. We will also take live questions at the end of the panel presentations. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website and in social media. Our panelists today include Rob Favor, Director, Mason Physical Services. Rob is the Director of Mason Physical, Serv Physical Services. He oversees the intelligent automation projects and their implementation for the university. He is also the lead project manager for the forthcoming Intelligent Automation Center for Excellence at George Mason. Matt Bartles, Automation Lead Consultant Impact Makers. Matt is a seasoned professional with over 13 years of experience in data, data analysts, data analysis, consumer experience design, robotic process, or RP, or robotic process automation, and no code development. Managing lean and agile management with automation technology, he's helped clients streamline processes, saving over million manual hours of manual work. Anthony Fong, the Vice President of Intelligent Automation at Impact Makers. Anthony is, was previously Deputy Secretary of Technology for the Commonwealth of Virginia. He has extensive experience working with universities on a variety of intelligent automation solutions. And then of course, Don, Doran Montagnu, co-director of the Virginia Academic Intelligent Automation Community of Practice. He is the co-founder of the IA initiative at the Center for Business Civic Engagement at George Mason. He has completed the RPA developer certification and holds the RPA awareness and business analyst certified diplomas. He has 15 years plus experience in international business and policy research. Again, thank you for joining us. We're glad you're with us. And Dornan, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you very much, David. I'm truly excited to be here today with Impact Makers, our community practice partners, um, and you, our online um, tech and non-technical uh, audience. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it will be another building block session for, uh, uh, for our attendees. Uh, just kindly remind you about our mission at the Virginia Academic Intelligent Automation Community of Practice, which is to help public and private Virginia colleges and universities Universities become acquainted, educated, and learn the power of intelligent automation and how it can benefit institutions of higher learning, be more efficient and effective towards building higher levels of student experience. As a pioneering initiative, the community of practice is a collaborative effort among all Commonwealth schools of higher education to also overcome the technical management and operational challenges that arise in designing and deploying effective intelligent automation programs and initiative. This includes important initiatives such as designing common standards for credentialing, ensuring privacy and security, and designing common performance metrics to gauge institutional impact, providing for collaborating discussions and for individuals 
to have questions answered among other areas. Um, just please remember that this session, it is recorded and it will be available on our website and our social media in a few days. We kindly also urge you to forward it on to your colleagues if you find it beneficial. Um, and before uh, diving into uh, um, to the session, uh, I would just want to give you a quick breakdown of the agenda. Um, next, we'll hear from Tony Funk, who's also our COP advisor. Um, Rob Faber, he, our Mason colleague, who leads our Center of Excellence, will give us an overview about it right after Tony. And then finally, we'll hear from Matt. We'll follow Rob and he'll give us a highlight about the Power Automate platform and uh, will show us how to build a digital assistant live. And with this, Tony, please take it away. All right, Dorian. Well, thank you so much. And uh, first, I want to thank our co-hosts. I want to thank George Mason uh, Fiscal Services, uh, Rob over there, as well as David and Doran over at the Virginia Automation Academic Community of Practice. And thank you for joining this uh, webinar. A little bit about Impact Makers. Uh, Impact Makers is a business and technology consulting firm offering intelligent automation, advisory, engineering, and analytics solutions. And our primary clients are government, uh, especially in Virginia. And also we have a number of higher education uh, clients as well. So one of the things that I really am excited about with this presentation is having seen the transformation, whether it be in government or higher education institutions, the ability to be able to leverage a tool like intelligent automation, and it has different components, uh, being able to use it to be able to quickly prototype and as well as deliver value, uh, it's very transformational in a very quick period of time. So what I hope is you take away from this presentation is you know, an understanding of intelligent automation and the potential of how it could reduce time performing mundane administrative tasks and workflows with uh, systems and, and things that you interact with, including like Banner or SAP as far as systems, to be able to give that time back to you and to be able to uh, help you uh, take that time and being able to uh, you know, serve your college or, or your university further in other areas by saving that time. And so if you have any questions afterwards uh, in, in, you know, to find out how you can start your uh, intelligent automation journey, please re reach out to me after the presentation. I want to thank you again and uh, pass it over to Rob. Hi, everybody. Um, oh. My slide's still showing the, uh, Let's go next. the uh, panelists, but I don't see the actual slide. Um. Rob, we can, we can have you go next. Uh, let me uh, get to the slide to the right spot real quick. Sure. Yay. <laughs> there we go. So uh, the I actually own the Automation Center of Excellence here in Fiscal Services of George Mason University. Um, uh, Differentiated from the COP, we're a practice area. So we um, we actually implement automation for fiscal services and other units within the university. Um, and so I guess we're a developer house, but we're also a resource for uh, our units uh, as they look into automating uh, as citizen developers or as the, if they have a more centralized type of automation, we'll, we'll uh, help them and be a resource to determine whether or not that's something we would do with RPA or something we would do with one of our other uh, automation offerings. Um, the COE was established following a pilot of robotic process automation using UiPath's RPA tool suite. Uh, during that process, Fiscal Services created a list of potential RPA opportunities that uh, numbered over 100. So we had a hundred different ideas of where we thought we could save some, some effort, uh, manual, uh, mundane, repetitive activities uh, and free up some capacity. Uh, we realized that there was definitely a ton of low hanging fruit, um, but ultimately we chose one automation uh, to use as a pilot back in uh, 2021. Uh, and based on that pilot, it was successful 
Uh, it was done actually by our central IT organization. Um, but we decided based on the experience of the pilot to remove, remove the sort of language barrier between our functional staff and the developer resources in our central IT group. And uh, by embedding the developer team in our functional unit, uh, this provides our development team increased focus, uh, contextual awareness of ideas and how they relate to our unit strategic plans, um, integration into our leadership team, uh, and an opportunity to put our own special sauce on how we approach the development life cycle. Um, we've engaged undergraduate and graduate students as paid interns uh, that are also developing in our COE. Uh, further, the developer role on our team includes a business analysis component, and that adds additional value to that student experience being involved in that analysis and not just road, uh, completing automation based on requirements. Um, the automation COE is tightly integrated with Mason's central IT unit um, using many of the already established systems uh, and framework. Um, that core group already had those things in place, so why would we reinvent the wheel? Um, we did adjust them slightly for uh, our approach, uh, but basically we've used uh, a lot of their framework for what we're doing in our development area. Um, that concept allowed us to accelerate our maturity timeline um, an unintentional benefit has included uh, a renaissance with regard to our fiscal processes. So as we're going through these ideas, we're actually understanding a lot better what our processes are. And even if they aren't automated, uh, we've approached those processes as a, as a business process redesign opportunity. Um, each idea submitted to the COE facilitates uh, a review and documentation of the related process and an evaluation of its validity and efficiency. Um, importantly, our mission scope does not include that business process redesign, but more specifically those process elements that need to be adjusted to accommodate uh, execution by a robot. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, here's some maturity milestones that we achieved. So we're actually on our third iteration of what we're calling the playbook, which is kind of our description of how we operate as a COE. Uh, we're gonna continue to iterate on those policies and procedures. We're, we're fairly young, but I think that our, our maturity is uh, farther along than it should be for our age. We started this as a true development house in January of this year. Um, uh, let's see, we have a fully integrated Azure virtual desktop environment for our robots. So they live in a virtual world. We still maintain a six week, three sprint target for any automation. What that means is that we, we limit what we're allowed to work on an automation to six weeks. And that's an incredibly short development life cycle, but it reinforces the goal of low code, low complexity, which is our mission. We wanna keep these simple uh, and we wanna keep the, the complexity of how we're doing it simple so that it can be operationally managed easier. Um, the COA is fortunate to have four interns currently working as developers. Two additional interns have already worked that have already worked with us have moved on. Uh, much of the feedback from the interns is uh, gratitude for providing an opportunity uh, to expand the marketable experience beyond just writing code. And they're they're deeply involved in the analysis and process design. Um, our prioritization framework includes. Uh, the concept of allowing developmental work on ideas that are lower in priorities, uh, but less complex, and therefore more, more educationally beneficial to those interns uh, if they're not a seasoned developer in RPA. Um, several citizen developers are now actively working on training uh, or initial coding. Um, we've laid out the groundwork to establish additional federated instances of our COE, uh, the Center of Excellence, within central IT and other business units at the university. Um, and we're actively participating in several group meetings uh, to discuss new automations, AI tools, and applications. Uh, most of these are higher ed related across the country. Um, one of them is the COP um, and uh, others are just groups of leaders of these sort of development houses. Um, Additionally, we're talking with other schools about sharing our list of automations and our backlog. Uh, 
uh, and that started a conversation between several of the Virginia State uh, institutions. And we're hoping to establish some synergy with these groups, particularly where our processes or systems usage are similar. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. So this is our maturity roadmap. Um, and on our original plot of this roadmap from a timeline perspective, we would be somewhere um, in the uh, emerging area based on the growth though of unsupported you can read unregulated automation at the institution, we've accelerated several areas of our roadmap. Um, we've, uh, we even surpassed the emerging milestone of this, this maturity model uh, and are now sort of into the impactful area uh, with some of the continuous improvement and citizen developer program activities touching that high performing phase. Um, we've been able to move faster to these areas because of our relentless use of existing systems uh, and processes in place uh, within our well-established central IT organization. And uh, we work with senior leadership team to focus uh, on risks and mitigating activities, alignment to strategic goals and providing feedback where we discover opportunities beyond our scope. Um, and I'd also like to give credit to impact makers for helping us in this journey, they've been absolutely uh, a, a godsend of, of support when it comes to first building our COE with us and then providing us an operational team to come in and help run it. Um, so I highly encourage you to consider um, using a vendor to help you get faster into uh, one of these maturity phases, which will allow you to get more return on investment to any kind of automation development area in your organizations. So I think that's all I have. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, we'll go over to uh, my slides here. Excuse me, excuse, excuse the scroll here. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Matt Bartles and uh, let's piggyback on Rob and talk about how intelligent automation can benefit higher education. Uh, I'd like to begin by defining on what exactly intelligent automation is, uh, and it can be confusing. Uh, we realize there's a lot of terms thrown around this industry, such as hyper automation, RPA, and et cetera. Uh, how I think of automation is a set of skills and tools that separate human and machine work. Ideally, humans are going to be responsible for tasks that involve critical thinking, problem solving, emotional intelligence, creativity, intuition, and nuanced decision making. This is where the people produce the most value in operations. Machines, particularly computers and robots, what we'll be talking mostly about today, uh, excel at repetitive structured tasks involving large amounts of data. Uh, over time, the machines are gonna win in work that is repetitive, structured, and involves large amounts of data. While we try to meet the high expectations our, our customers have for the outcomes of these processes. Um, but people will always win at creativity, uh, empathy, customer understanding, intuition, nuanced decision-making. So at its core, uh, intelligent automation combines artificial intelligence with machine capabilities to create uh, systems that execute tasks in decision-making and even learn from new data without the need for human intervention. And this is so we can go do the things that we're good at. Uh, with the rise of AI and machine learning, RPA capabilities, have greatly expanded uh, to include natural language processing, recognizing patterns, making predictions. So what we're talking about here is what is intelligent automation? It's RPA uh, fused with artificial intelligence. So next, next slide, please. Awesome. So what are the benefits of intelligent automation? Bots are ideal for legacy systems. Uh, they can interact directly with the user interfaces uh, mimicking uh, human interactions without the need for deep system integrations. And uh, you'll get to see this a, li a little bit in our demo. Uh, this makes them great for legacy platforms, uh, which a lot of times lack modern integrations like direct database uh, queries and APIs. And so by interfacing at the UI level, RPA can bridge that gap between the old systems and the new technologies. Uh, this helps extend the lifespan of the legacy investments uh, higher education has made. Uh, while it also facilitates digital transformation. You know, we can't uh, just 
transform all the systems at once in higher education. Uh, so this unique capabilities offers organizations a cost-effective solution to modernize without having to do full-scale replacements. Uh, intelligent automation is also fast. Um, it uses low-code platforms that speed uh, de uh, deployments. By simplifying development with pre-built machines, visual interfaces and drag and drop functionality. You don't have to write semantic code uh, uh, like, like you see in, in, in the movies. And you'll get more demos uh, or you'll get more uh, of a feel for this in the, uh, the demo. So instead of writing extensive code from scratch, developers and citizen developers can assemble applications uh, using these ready-made components. Uh, this greatly reduces the complexity of the development process allowing for rapid prototyping, iteration, and deployment, and it also has security built into. Um, Low-code platforms also cater to professional and citizen developers, which broadens the pool of people who can contribute to your technical solutions. This democratization accelerates solution delivery as organizations can leverage uh, their diverse talent to address business needs and increase uh, business agility. You can react to things a little bit faster when everybody has the tools they need to automate these processes. Uh, so low code's modular and user-friendly approach really speeds up application development compared to traditional tools by enabling that, that, that citizen development. And then I, uh, uh, intelligent automation is great for reducing the IT backlog. Uh, we're gonna go into this uh, deeply in the next slide. One of the things that's not listed in this, in this slide is, uh, not yet, uh, is um, cost savings aren't listed here. Intelligent automation mainly creates value by freeing up human potential, allowing us to do the things with, with that we, we are best at doing. Uh, it helps offset additional hiring uh, needed to scale manual processes. Um, and I was at a bank once uh, and they we acquired a, a new uh, another bank. Instead of hiring 200 new additional people, we automated a bunch of that work, kept the existing workforce uh, and didn't have to scale using human labor. We scaled using, using um, uh, robotic talent. Um, so this reduces the technical uh, investment needed for digital transformation. Um, and next slide, please. So where exactly can higher education use intelligent automation? Looking at this graph here, um, we uh, see our clients have their, their scaled and high viewing process on this graph on the far, far left. This is the, uh, the, the large processes that universities maintain, and they've largely solved these with existing technical solutions, right? They're using uh, software as a service or maybe some custom applications and data mesh applications. So these large processes have received large technical investment and a lot of times aren't, aren't the, main, the main headache for uh, some of the institutions. However, many of these smaller processes, this long tail of thousands of desktop activities or small manual processes that everybody seems to be doing, this is where we see uh, intelligent automation playing because they haven't really been technically enabled yet. These are processes that are being done with email, Excel, and a few other systems and that are using the human as the integration. The human is doing swivel chair operations to move data from one system to the next. And this is where we see intelligent automation being used most effectively. One of the ways we, we, we think about this is these large uh, process problems, these are dragon-sized problems. And we have to attack those differently than the thousands of these snake-sized manual processes. And this is why we use low-code solutions that are fast and easy, that enable citizen development, uh, so that more of the workforce can participate in reducing this IT backlog. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, Rob alluded to this, but great automations programs recognize and establish the steps needed to elevate their processes and operations. In this demo, I'm going to, do, I'm, I'm going to show you how easy and simple it is to, de to develop a, a bot. Uh, you know, we picked a very simple use case, one that we can do on a webinar, but I believe that, that uh, most, most people can, can learn to build a bot. Uh, in practice, it takes much longer to master the process of discovering uh, what is happening in operations, analyzing it, enhancing and re-engineering it so it can be uh, put to, uh, uh, it, so that it can be automated, so that it can have a technical destination. We typically recommend that clients start discovering their process and um, building out a backlog um, so, so they can understand what the landscape looks like. 
And often we find a lot of surprise happening and just how much manual work is happening. Uh, the next step we talk about is an, 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 an anal analysis, uh, taking a look at that inventory of manual processes and looking at what bottlenecks are revealed. Maybe many people are doing a small amount of the process and one person can be doing a large amount of the process. Uh, we start to see inefficiencies like excessive or inadequate controls or inadequate reporting and other opportunities uh, for enhancement for automation. Uh, many processes are going to require some enhancement in order to be automated or put in a technical state. A lot of times these process changes are going to be uh, involved uh, 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 about how uh, data is handled. Machines need very structured data and a lot of manual processes today um, are working on unstructured data. So the data often needs to be uh, uh, placed in a more structured um, what, uh, uh, format. Uh, some additional checks and features are often installed as part of that enhancement. And some change management off frequently has to happen in order to make sure our, our people can, can coordinate with the bots. And, and finally, the last step, step four, um, is really the easiest. We're going to do a demo of that today. It's the least intimidating. Note the destination technology here is automation. Um, however, all these steps are really the same for any digital transformation. Could be uh, the destination, could be uh, artificial intelligence, a data platform. Uh, or, or software as a service, mastering steps one, two, and three are, are remain critical, regardless of uh, the destination. Uh, this is really truly the key to te technical transformation. A, a software platform uh, hasn't been invented yet that can really kind of do the, the hard work for you. And we realize, uh, and one of the reasons I love this, this slide and this metaphor is that steps one, two, and three are difficult. And we understand that universities don't have a lot of extra capacity to do the additional work to climb this staircase. Um, so by partnering with the Mason COP, the COE and impact makers, we can be helpful resources for you to start this journey. So uh, also, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to go to slide uh, 14. Uh, Matt, with your permission, uh, this is very good. Before we move into the next one, maybe we can remind our audience. We're already having some uh, questions that there are uh, in the Q&A box, but if you feel like there's something that you're more curious about it, um, uh, we can address them you know, in the Q&A sure. session after you uh, you finish your presentation. Uh, so thank you. Do, do we want to answer a question now or, or do we want to move on to the, uh, the power? No, we'll, we'll move on and then we'll address okay. it uh, towards the end. Keep awesome. doing what you're doing. This is very exciting. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you nice all are excited. I, I love talking about automation. Uh, next, As they're next saying, time, times to get dirty. Yeah, we're going to get dirty here soon. So, uh, to help set up the found, uh, to help establish a, a foundation for this demo, we're going to give you a quick overview of the Power Platform. The Power Platform is relatively new. It was launched in uh, 2019, so not everybody's familiar with it, but all of us have it. Um. It, the Microsoft Power Platform is an integrated application platform that has really four major components, uh, Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power Virtual Agents. It's not just bots anymore. These, the, the Power Platform is, it has a lot of capabilities. Uh, these pool, tools are very empowering. They empower organizations to analyze their data, uh, build native solutions, automate processes, create virtual agents, and really streamline their operations and enhance decision making without having to have deep coding expertise. Where the, the expertise is required is in steps one, two, and three, and the understanding of the business process, empathizing with the customer and engineering your processes so they can be placed in technical state. But the Microsoft Power Platform makes it very easy. Um, so again, Power BI facilitates data visualization and business analytics. Uh, Power Apps allows you to create small custom applications with no code. And Power Virtual Agents uh, helps you um, uh, build chatbots. But what we'll be demo demoing today is actually Power Automate, uh, which enables automated workflows uh, between apps and services. So next slide, please. And then, hey, why, why do we uh, use the Power Platform? There's, there's a bunch of competitor, uh, competitor platforms out there. Uh, the Microsoft Power Platform is very uh, cost-effective. It costs significantly, it's, it's significantly more cost effective than many of its competitors. Uh, many higher education, higher education institutions are already paying for an A3 or A5 license, uh, which enables uh, some of the features of the Power Platform out of the gate. Uh, 
I think on A3, it's very limited. A5, it's a little bit more, uh, less limited. But to get the additional features, well, some of the ones that I'm going to be showing you today, uh, additional licenses are needed. Uh, however, they're typically on the order of 30 ish a month, uh, $30 a month. Um, and, and please don't quote me on that. Every, um, uh, every institution has their own um, uh, contract with, with Microsoft, um, but it, it makes it very, very competitively priced. Another great part of the Power Platform, it uses native solutions. Uh, the vast majority of our clients are on the Microsoft platform. Um, Google has about 10% of that of the market share in, in the productivity software space. That's pretty deceptive, though, because most of the companies using uh, the, the Google platform uh, are small, medium-sized businesses, businesses with less than 100 employees. So the vast majority of uh, uh, people seeking automation programs are on the Microsoft platform. Using the Microsoft platform uh, over a competitor uh, maintains simplicity uh, by reducing the, the platforms and administration required. Um, not that the Microsoft platform has easy um, um, administration, but it, it, it reduces just one last platform to maintain. It also has uh, the same security and compliance as your existing Microsoft tenant. So that, that's very important. And, and the most important part about being native solutions is today, many of the manual processes that are being run uh, at, at many of our client sites involve the Microsoft stack. So people are solving, uh, hey, I get uh, a spreadsheet, uh, sent to me an Outlook. It's an Excel. I, I open up that Excel and then um, I uh, go into a system of record. Because a lot of these processes exist in the, the Microsoft universe, that makes them very uh, easy to uh, uh, run on the Power Platform. And finally, uh, Microsoft has an enormous roadmap for the Power Platform. Uh, over the past several years, they have consistently added features uh, at a dizzying pace uh, to catch up and in some cases actually surpass their competitors. Uh, we expect that most co uh, clients, their first taste of, of AI, if, if enabled, will happen in Copilot. Um, and, and Copilot is the Microsoft AI, uh, branded AI, uh, and, and the Power Platform will be uh, central to that. There are a few downsides to the Power Platform. I, I won't spend much time here. Uh, the Microsoft environment can be a bit uh, tough to navigate. Uh, there is a learning curve to the, the, the Microsoft environment. Uh, some concepts such as the dataverse, uh, uh, access, administration, and licensing, they aren't always the most intuitive, uh, but this is something that, 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 that can be quickly learned and absorbed. Um, I think that one of the biggest downsides um, for the Microsoft platform um, is they have a lot of uh, a competitor platform, uh, competitor platforms have a lot more governance and management of citizen developers uh, embedded to that, their, um, their systems or their platforms. They also do a little bit better job of process intake. Um, so uh, I, I do expect the power platform to get caught up here. Um, and uh, without any further questions, we can go to the live bot build. And boy, does a live bot build make me nervous, but we're gonna we're gonna get this stuff. Uh, do you mind if I share my screen? I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. Who's excited? Everyone. Everybody's super excited. Uh, can you uh, see yourselves or do I need to minimize this? We, need, we want to see the bot. We don't want to see All right, we want to see the bot. Go well, ahead. first, uh, I'm going to introduce you to the process. The digital um, assistant, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, the, the virtual assistant. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce you to the process. Uh, what we are going to do today is we're going to waive some student fees. Um, I, I love waiving fees. I'm a student myself, uh, and those fees come in. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend a, a process manager um, gets an Excel, and this is how most uh, most manual processes start. That has a list of student IDs, their account balance, and their fees to waive. So we're going to be doing waive fee waiving fees. Um, the bot is then going to go into Spanner 2000, which is a legacy system that we have built for this demo. Uh, it's a higher education ERP system to meet your every need, designed in the year 2000. Uh, and it's very legacy. And what a, uh, a process engineer would do, or a process manager would do, is they would go in, they would go in and search for a student. 
they would find their fee, say $89. Okay, well, let's set that fee to zero, save, and move on to the next row. Here we have uh, six rows of data, but unfortunately, many of our associates are doing um, many, many rows of data. And that repetitive work is, is, is really machine work. So we're going to automate that today. Any, any uh, questions or thoughts in the chat? Let's uh not yet, not yet. They're All thinking. Right. What I'm going the... to do is I'm going to show you what this bot looks like finished. What does it look like when it's absolutely finished? And then um uh we'll build towards that. So I have a video here. Uh we record the videos of these bots. Sometimes they can be problematic on Zoom. So please forgive me here. And this is what a bot looks like. It look it got the Excel data in the back end. You never saw it. It's searching for students. This is a this is a, a a robot running the thing. It's cycling through these students. Um, I have it moving at a little bit of a slower pace so that you can actually visually see it. Uh, and there's also some limitations on how fast uh, the UI can run. So this is a bot running on its own on a desktop. And then what it's going to do here is once it's done eliminating student fees, which I'm very excited about. Um, this is all fake data, by the way. No, no actual student fees have been waived, unfortunately. Uh, so after it waives the fees, it's going to go in and it's going to send an email. Uh, it's going to send an email to say, hey, um, uh, the process worked and we have 100% uh, compliance. Oh, please pull it up, pull it up. And we open up Outlook and we can see, oh, student fee waiver report. Right, it's a pretty simple process, uh, but a lot of times these simple processes, they add up and it's like dealing with hundreds of snakes at work. All right, so the first process is opening up Excel and getting data out of Excel. I'm gonna to refer to my notes here because I always get nervous uh, while uh, developing in front of a crowd here. So to do this, uh, this is the typical low code platform uh, that you can see on your screen. I apologize about being a little small. There's not much I can do about that. Um, but what we have here is a list of commands, right? And because we wanna look at Excel, we're gonna go in the Excel commands. These commands can do nearly anything a human can do, right? So we're gonna go to Excel. We're gonna launch Excel. Uh, we're gonna open a document. The document is going to be the weekly data pool. Uh, this is the list of accounts that we have our students, uh, that we have the student fees that need to be waived. We're going to read the data from the uh, Excel. We're going to get um, all available values from the worksheet. Then we're going to go ahead and close Excel. Not, We don't need to save the document. Um, and then what I'd like to do is uh, display a message. Uh, display a message that says, you know, just allows for this group uh, to see that, hey, it, it truly it truly does work. And we're going to go ahead and put that Excel data. We're just going to dump it uh, for now in this message box. But just know, hey, it's stored in computer memory so we can use it in, in the next step of the process. All right, so uh, fingers crossed it works in, 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 a, in the demo environment. Launch Excel. And there we go. It launched Excel, read all the data, and now it's in the computer memory for us to be able to manipulate, right? It doesn't look very nice, uh, but it's there. And now it read the Excel and has all the data, right? So I'm gonna build these uh, parts separately, please forgive me. So the next thing that we wanna do, the second part, is we wanna go ahead, launch that website, and then uh, uh, up, remove those fees from that data, right? So to do that, I'm going to do some browser automation. I'm going to uh, launch a new Microsoft Edge instance. Not all of us like Microsoft Edge, uh, but what I do like about Microsoft Edge is it's integrated into Power Platform. 
uh, and it makes it a little bit easier um, uh, to integrate with. I'm going to go ahead and give it the web our website address, right? And so um, one of the cool parts about um, intelligent automation is we can actually record human action. So what I'm going to do here is I have the Excel open. I'm going to teach this robot how to do data entry. Uh, where did my uh, we did. so um, let me show you how to do that. Do, do, do. Excuse me here. It's a little bit harder to do with the uh, Zoom. So we're going to record our actions. We're going to record here. I'm going to have the computer click the input box. 738. Type in that. I'm going to have the computer learn to click the customer ID. I'm going to have the computer learn to uh, zero out the fee and save. Right? And then I'm going to tell this, the computer to stop learning. Right? So what should happen here? Is that the robot should open up the web browser and go zero at that that student's fee. So let's let's see if, if that indeed works. Okay, opens up there, searches for student, 9738. I'm not touching the screen at all. This is the bot doing everything. And then it's learned to zero at that account fee. Pretty, pretty, pretty slick, right? We just taught a robot how to, to do a manual process. Um, and then the final thing that I'm going to do here now, uh, you know, for intensive purposes of the demo, what we would do is we would take that Excel data, we would put it in a loop, and it would go through and do every student's account. Uh, for brevity, uh, I'm just major. I'm doing the major highlights here. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out. Uh, so we're going to start over. And then we're going to teach the robot how to do some emailing. Um, I personally enjoy email, so it pains me a lot that a little bit that a robot will do it. Um, so we will go ahead and uh, look at Outlook. We're going to drag and drop the launch Outlook. We're going to send an email message through Outlook. And uh, you can see, you know, this, if I were to do this in Python, it would take me about I don't know, 30 lines of code. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and type in, hey, what account were you going to use? And let's let's go ahead and use my um, my Impact Maker account. And I'll just send it to myself for now. Oh, I need to I need to fix that. Oh, that's not good. Oh, spelling is not my best suit. Yeah, I mean, let me fix this one. Thank you. And uh, we could paste data in here or a report in here. But for brevity, I'm just going to say, hey, it works. Awesome. And then we're going to launch Outlook, close Outlook. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of trick here, which is going to insert a delay. Um, uh, uh, We're going to insert a little bit of a wait here, just because sometimes my computer, especially when I'm sharing my screen, it takes about uh, five, six seconds to um, uh, send and receive an email. Um, so we're going to launch Outlook, send a quick message, wait five seconds, and then close Outlook to make sure that message gets processed. Let's go ahead and see if they can run. Oh, that's because I already have Outlook open. It gave me an error, it threw an error message saying, hey, I can't launch Outlook because Outlook's already launched. So let me fix that and run it again. So it's authoring the email. This report can be as, as thorough and as small as we want. And then uh, went ahead and closed Outlook. Let me see if that email indeed went through. Yep. 
your privacy matters. And come on, it did, it works. So in about 10 minutes, I helped develop the, uh, help, help the robot learn to do the three major components of most manual tasks. Open up Excel, iterate through that Excel, dump it in a, in a, in a legacy system, and then send a report. So that concludes the demo. I wanna remind everyone that the intelligent automation process, the automation is the easiest part. Um, the hard part is figuring out what to do, how best to do it, and getting everybody to do the change management around that process. If you can master steps one, two, and three, any destination technology um, can be your, uh, you can put your process in any destination technology. And with that, I will conclude my portion of the demo, and we will go to Q&A. Uh, yeah, can you share your screen? And uh, there we go. Yeah, awesome. that's very good. It, it indeed that was. The I fun didn't part have to. Uh, I was really excited. I didn't have to go to playing the live videos of the bots. So yeah, I'm glad that went well. At um, one point, my concern it was if the bots actually they would get a speeding fee. So then you waive the student fee, but then the bot gets it. So how are you gonna, <laughs> you know, how balance it? But I think uh, it worked out well. <laughs> I did automate a, a process once in banking. And they were concerned, uh, they trusted one of the, it takes a while to build uh, trust in automation. And they were concerned mm -hmm. the bot was gonna steal the uh, the bank money. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what is the bot gonna spend it on? Uh, but th th that argument did not work. Oh, wow. Uh, awesome. Well, that's so, good. Well, we have a few questions here from our audience. So with your permission, um, yeah. we can go ahead and uh, tackle those. Um, well, thanks again for uh, for this presentation to both of you. Um, I hey, Jordan, also... yes. let me just ask Matt two quick questions, which sure. I think will be on the minds of many people. So I'm sitting at a university. George Mason has 40,000 students. JMU has 14,000 students. How many, that bot, how many fees can be waived? How many students can be yeah. in the capacity of their fees waived? Are we uh, talking six? Are we talking 100? Are we talking a thousand? Are we talking it, multi thousand? It could, it could scale through the entire population. Um, and one of the things that I would state as if we have a process that is 50,000 people, that shouldn't be a, a human running that process. Humans running through Excel, that, that, that's, that, that's not human work. Right. Um, at the 50,000 uh, scale process, I would encourage a client to consider including this in a traditional technology stack. Um, but maybe if it was a thousand or two thousand, this might be a great use for RPA. Yeah. So be cognizant of cognizant of scale. Um, now the bots can certainly do ten thousand or a million. Um, uh, one of the bots that I have built uh, was doing three hundred thousand units of work, complex units of work, uh, much more complicated than this uh, per month. So they're able to do scale, um, and we work with our clients to figure out, hey. For scaled process, what is your destination technology? One of the deciding factors will be how fast do you need it? Do you need to start waiving these fees tomorrow? Because if you need to start waiving them tomorrow and you can't wait for traditional IT, then uh, intelligent automation is your solution. Did that help? Excellent. Did that help answer your question? Yeah, it did. And then, so I'm the student or you're the student. Mm -hmm. Can you direct the email to the student saying your fee has been waived? Yes. The bot would then have to, we'd have to add a little data field to right. that. And we would have to, um, uh, but this would be a simple engineering. You could say, hey, uh, your student, or your fee, your student fee of $68 was waived. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Got it. Okay. Excellent. It could, it could be as easy as that. And now where you're going, doctor, is great process design. Right. And now your mind no longer is exists on, oh, I got to get this work done. And, oh, I got to wave these fees. What in this simple question you revealed that your, your thinking has gone from getting the mechanics done to creating a great student experience. Yeah. And that's yeah. where we want to see our business operations be. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Because I, I even if it, you're, you're getting with 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, you could break it down to really departments in the schools which have smaller numbers of students. So you're at like the Shara school. I think we have like 6,000 students that could easily be done 
But in humanities, they may have 10,000 students. They could create their own bot as well because there are probably specific fees that they charge or they levy on students, which then they decide we don't need the money or, you know, we're going to give them a refund to develop good, uh, better student relationships where we save money. The, the possibilities truly are, are endless uh, because no longer you're, you as a, as a business or as a unit or a department uh, have the flexibility to uh, design your own process without having to worry about like, hey, how am I going to get this on the tech backlog? Because it, it, it's given these departments some level of control. Right, right. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'll, Dorn, and I'll throw it to you. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I think that was very good and insightful. I wanted to ask, um, because both of you mentioned about, you know, priorities and urgencies, but also, um, you know, ways of tackling, uh, you know, this this whole automation journey. From your perspective, and maybe here, um, Rob can also talk about this too. To what extent is the vision of automation within the enterprise important uh, based on what you've been uh, uh, seeing and how you tackle this? Is it, because we hear based on, on our research, some of them, they say, okay, the vision is very important. Other ones, low hanging fruits is like, from your perspective, which one do you think it's it's the 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 ratio or what's the most important? Maybe on both sides, maybe Matt or also Rob. Rob, I'll, I'll let you go first. I've done too much talk. Sure. Um, so strategic vision is very important in terms of how the automation is strategically managed. Um, sure, we go after low-hanging fruit um, if we have a ton of low hanging fruit on a list of potential automation ideas, and we can knock out 15 of them giving us an overall ROI higher than if we were to hit one six month automation. Um, I think that there is room in the strategic guidance to consider, like I said, sometimes we'll address a lower priority automation because it will give us the opportunity to let someone tackle a, a less complex, easy type automation so that they can learn from it and get up to speed faster so that they can then take on a more complex automation. There is a learning curve uh, for a lot of this in terms of the developers, um, you know, specifically in the development house, right? In, in citizen development, there is also a learning curve um, but the governance of what goes first is more related to a departmental need versus a strategic need. So in our case, the COE is institutional. We generally focus on what the strategic uh, alignment is to what we're doing to one of those strategic goals and how do we impact that directly. And that's where we base our ROI um, for any automation that we do. Right. Thank you. Uh, Matt, is there anything that you want to add to this or uh, we go I, to the next question? I completely agree. And, and you know, the bot, the lift of the bot is the easy part. The establishing the uh, uh, the governance, getting stakeholders involved and upskilling uh, to think in, in the, with the technology destination. That's the hard part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's what research serves as well. Okay, let's go to the other one. Actually, this is to you, um, but anyone else can jump into it. It says, it is possible to program the bot to check if Outlook is running first and launch if not. Yeah, yeah, th that's true. Um, you uh, not only need to design the process to fit in the technology, you actually have to master the tool itself and understand about hey, checks and balances. Uh, something, for example, I, I didn't show was what if a student had a fee of like $10,000? A human would raise their hand. A, a, a good process manager would be like, I don't think this uh, person should have a $10,000 fee. That seems outrageous. If you don't explicitly teach a bot, that bot will waive that $10,000 fee without asking a question. And that might, might not be what the in, original intent was for that fee. So mm -hmm. yes, I agree. You can you can install a check and control to make sure Outlook is open and closed and, and, and files are formatted correctly. You also have to be mindful of the 
undocumented controls that a human would have? When would a human raise their hand when it's like, wow, this person has a million dollar fee. That doesn't seem reasonable. We need to go take a look and fix this account. We need to investigate. You need to install those controls as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really valid point, uh, Matt. And I think um, one of the controls that we put in place for citizen developers is that we ask for a code review. So our, our team will look at the code that they've created and validate that they've taken appropriate steps to put in error handling or uh, traps for something like uh, if it's over this amount, stop and ask a question. You know, so that's part of that intelligent piece of intelligent automation is even if it's not AI, it's still intelligent if you're building the logic specifically to, to look for things that a human might look for. And that also helps the process piece of it. As I said in my presentation section, this drives a lot of business process redesign. <clears throat> if your process doesn't say, if it's over a thousand dollars, ask a question, don't, don't actually just go process it. If you have a, an intern that comes in and starts on day one and reads the process, an intern might refund that, that $10,000 fee if, that's what the process said to do. And that's what a robot's doing. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you told it to do. All right. Very well said. Thank you. Here's one more. Um, we'll get take a couple more and then we're at the top of the hour. So we'll make sure um, we finish in time. What level of IT compliance do you find needed to govern citizen developers automating their own workflows? Addressing the typical concern of runaway bots or updating volumes of production systems incorrectly? You want me to address it, Matt? Oh, please. Rob, I, I'd love to see hear you address this, please. <laughs> well, there's a there's sort of a gray area and a balancing act that goes on. The, the ease of entry for citizen developers is part of the ROI that comes out of using citizen developers. Um, but yes, there needs to be some sort of framework put in place to review the code to ensure that there uh, aren't system impacts. I think also from a strategic perspective, if you have citizen developers that are actively building automation, then there needs to be system controls in place to identify when transactions are occurring at a rate that's outside the norm and flag that for investigation. So th that's why what we do is very integrated in with IT, IT security, IT monitoring. Um, uh, and as the citizen developers join us, and come into the fold, the cost of our support is that we, we want them to follow a particular guideline. So we give them some, some loose boundaries around which they have to participate. Also, we ask them to provide us with their ROI so that we can include it in a, 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 an institutional report of what our automation is getting us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything to add, uh, Matt? Or Maybe you will uh, that was, tackle this one. I think that was well said. Um, uh, making sure you have appropriate throttles and are learning your way into citizen development um, is, is critical. Starting out with a few uh, very talented uh, people who are very hungry for automation is typically where, where we start. And um, then those citizen developers can be the ones that help um, evangelize citizen development itself. Uh, so we've seen a lot of growth through creating picking and creating great initial set citizen developers and then having them be the uh, the North Star for other people to follow. Mm -hmm. Here's another question, which I think aligns to what or to what you've been just recently saying. Can you talk to the this can you talk to the decision to automate versus upgrade your system to create efficiencies? When is it an automation band-aid appropriate versus full system upgrade or replacement? Are both ever done often? First, automate to get ROI immediately while system upgrades or replacement projects are on the way in the long term? I'll take, a, big, I'll, I'll take a That's a big it depends, it. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, a strong uh, automation program will be um, have a good relationship with te their technology department as well. And so you'll understand the roadmaps for their major platform upgrades. And as the... Um, uh, automation program matures, you'll start to see your processes surround themselves around one feature. Like, hey, if we just had direct data uh, calls from Banner, 
we would be able, and this is just an example, if we could pull uh, data directly from Banner, this would solve 25 manual processes. This is the kind of like common bottlenecks that we find. And in those cases, if, if 25 manual processes rely on one single feature, our preference is to have that feature uh, part of an upgrade path versus having 25 bots on top of it. So e each thing is its own balancing act. Um, where the person responsible for that balancing act is typically the COE lead or solution architect working in concert with the, the larger IT roadmap. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it one more. everything depends. I'll give you one more before we're heading out for lunch. David, you want to say, you want to say something? You're a mute. Sorry about that. So quick question to you, Matt, because I'm fascinated by your example. So currently at a smaller university, they're giving the Excel spreadsheet to some staffer who's supposed to go in and make change all the numbers to zero. Correct. But let's say it's a, a list of 150 people. I know in my case, that means you hit return, you go back, you ace it out, you put zero in. That's pretty intense time spent. Mm hmm which is time could be used for something else for the university. And what about the potential for errors in your example? Yeah, um, I didn't do air handling in this particular example. Um, our typical air handling philosophy when working on top of UIs is uh, look, change, confirm. So in this case, what it would have done is, hey, is the fee amount the expected amount? Is it $58 or is it $100,000? If it's the expected amount, change it. And once you submitted the change, go back to that account, query it, and make sure that change was performed correctly. So you do a uh, uh, look, change, confirm is uh, typically how we do UI interactions. Um, also inside the bot itself, it'll have some error handling like Windows reset has to happen and it, it'll, it'll, it'll stop. And what it should do is that it should, it should inform the user to say, hey, I ran um, and I experienced a failure. Um, and it can inform the user in a variety of ways. It can build a, uh, a business intelligence dashboard. It could also uh, potentially send an email, which we, we should demonstrate it here. People are, email, people are very email centric in some organizations. Some organizations are very BI uh, centric. Hey, uh, Matt, yeah. can I jump in just real quick? Oh, please. I, 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 before we run out of time, David, you, you said something that that triggered actually an answer to one of the questions as well. Matt was addressing errors in the robot, but in terms of what we consider to be return on investment, we include, or we're trying to include, and arguably we're not quite as mature as we should be, but we're trying to get there in terms of reporting. We include what is the cost of an error that a human is going to make? Yeah. Versus a robot that doesn't make those errors. And additionally, if you've got 50,000 of these records to go through, that's going to take quite a long time for a human to do it or even several humans to do that. And you have people that are waiting for that, that fee to be waived. They're calling and asking what's going on, which means someone has to customer service, look into their record. And that's time spent dealing with the fact that it was taking so long for these things to occur. If a robot can do this overnight, you've just saved not only customer satisfaction, but you've also saved the added time that it takes people to respond to inquiries because the, the whatever the thing is that's supposed to happen isn't happening very quickly. So there's a lot of ROI out there beyond just, well, this saves you know 20 minutes a day. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot more to it in terms of dollars and how do you yeah. calculate it and, and right. what we're trying to do now is figure out how do we report that up? How do we report that to our leadership and to the institution beyond just ours? What are the yeah. metrics? How are we calculating it? Let alone the student goodwill, the anxiousness, everything else that goes on when people look at their accounts and it's not correct. Yeah, I mean, how do you put a finite dollar amount yeah. attached to customer satisfaction? Yeah. It's hard to do. Sorry, yeah. Jordan, back to you. No, no, I think uh, this also answered uh, the last question that we had. So, um, but anyhow, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, coming today and for being with us. Um, 
I think if you want to learn more from you know from our uh, uh, panelists and guests, uh, please or from us, uh, feel free to contact them uh, directly or send us uh, an email. Um, these were all great questions. Um, we realize that everyone has to go to lunch now. So thank you, uh, everyone. Please don't forget to uh, um, follow us on uh, uh, on our website for updates and also on social media for the recording of the of the video. We'll be ready in a few days. Also, the ones who are present here who want to engage with our community of practice, please contact us, uh, call us. We're happy to uh, to talk to you, to share with our uh, uh, knowledge and uh, um, see how we can we can grow and make sure that the students and the higher education and, and the future of the country is benefiting from these emerging technologies. So with Dean being said, um, David, if you want to say something. Uh, well, I'll just uh, say thank adjourn, you, everybody. We'll push out the email, phone numbers, the contact information to make it easy for you to connect with us. Thank you, guys. It was a great panel, great session. We really appreciate the George Mason forward thinking on intelligent automation, what they're doing. And thanks to Impact Makers. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.